on the 11th Sunday of the season, we call to mind the inclusion section of the proposed revision of the Unitarian Universalist bylaws, which says, systems of power, privilege, and oppression have traditionally created barriers for persons and groups with particular identities, ages, abilities, and histories. We pledge to replace such barriers with ever widening circles of solidarity and mutual respect. Mission impossible, not when we're fired with commitment. Our opening hymn is 1028 in the blue teal hymnal, Fire of Commitment. Please rise in body or spirit. Good morning. I am Martha Sherrick Shen. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. Your celebrant association, associate this morning. <laughs> and I'm the Reverend Meredith Garman, Zizir, or he, him, interim minister. Welcome to the First Unitarian Church of Des Moines. Our church is located on land that has been home to various people in the last 12,000 years, including at the beginning of the European encroachment, the Iowa, Sauk, and Meskwaki. This was also home to the Eastern Elk, extinct since 1880. As we enter this space, the ghosts of humans and other animals past are among us. 
Let us recommit to understanding the history of the land it occupies and to owning our part in the work of education, reparation, and healing for all species. The purpose of this church is to associate ourselves together for the study and practice of morality and religion as interpreted by the growing thought and noblest lives of humanity, hoping thereby to prove helpful to one another and to promise truth and to promote truth, righteousness, and love in the world. This bond of union is reiterated in our mission to grow ethically and spiritually, serve justly, and who love radically. It's a blessing you were born. It matters what you do. Your experience of the divine is true, and you don't have to go it alone. Today is the 11th Sunday of autumn. The beaver moon was full last Sunday night and is now waning gibbous. On the Jewish calendar, Hanukkah begins at sundown on Thursday. The eight-day festival commemorates the recovery of Jerusalem and the rededication of the Second Temple at the beginning of the second century BCE Maccabean revolt against the Seleucid Empire. The empire struck back, as empires do, but by the end of the century, Judea had won full independence, which lasted for 40 years, and then the Romans came. And in that context, the Christian story begins. Thus, today is the first Sunday of Advent, the four Sundays before Christmas. The theme for the first Sunday of Advent is hope. A special welcome to our visitors. If you are here with children, feel free to keep them seated with you or to take advantage of our We Worship space in the back of the auditorium where you and your child may play with toys and books. Newcomers are invited to a UU Curiosity Conversation on the first Sunday of every month, which means there is one today. It's immediately after the service in the back of this auditorium sanctuary. Please silence your cell phones during the service. If you are joining us via Zoom, please make sure your mics are muted throughout the service. Our theme of the month for December is transformation. Our connection circles are small groups that gather to explore the monthly theme and build relationships. It's a key way that we live out this mission we have to grow ethically and spiritually. So if you're not in one, please do sign up and become a part of the group and see the back of your order of service. And if you don't have a copy of Connecting, our in-house monthly periodical exploring the theme of the month, please do pick up the new issue just outside in the, in the basket just outside. We begin with the lighting of our chalice. Please join me in our chalice lighting words in the order of service. May this flame, symbol of transformation since time began, fire our curiosity, strengthen our wills, and sustain our courage as we seek what is good within and around us. Our spoken invocation is a poem by Donna Markova that speaks of her vow. I will not die an unlived life. I will not live in fear of falling or catching fire. I choose to inhabit my days to allow my living to open me, to make me less afraid more accessible to loosen my heart until it becomes a wing, a torch, a promise. I choose to risk my significance to live so that which came to me as seed goes on to the next as blossom. And that which came to me as blossom goes on as fruit. Please now join in the sung, sung invocation, words in your order of service.
Good morning. My name is Birch Spick. My pronouns are they, them, and theirs. And I am your faith formation and congregational life coordinator. For today's story, I need some help telling it. This is a story about a hand. Welcome. Would you like to come up? No? OK. Not that much help. This is a story about the things that make the world, like clouds and trees and wind. So I need some people to act out trees and clouds and wind with Meredith. Would anybody from our elementary class like to come up and help? Yes, come up, come up. Would anybody else like to come up? You don't have to be in the class to join us. Penny, wonderful, thank you. And thank you, Dante. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Thank you all. Come on up as I begin this story. We are telling the story Making the World by Douglas Wood, illustrated by Yoshi and Hibiki Miyazaki. There's a secret that almost nobody knows. I will tell you if you promise to tell someone else. <laughs> the world isn't finished yet. It isn't quite complete. It's still being made. Everywhere you look and everywhere you listen, someone or something is helping to make the world. A morning breeze brushes the water, making ripples and waves that wash the shore. Where the waves touch the land, sand and pebbles are worn, and the world is changed. A breeze helps make the world. A painted lady butterfly tickling the breeze with gentle wings floats like a flower in the wind. A butterfly helps make the breeze more beautiful. It helps make the world. A wildflower blooming like a butterfly with leaves and roots flutters in the breeze. It gives the butterfly a sweet sip of nectar and helps to make the world. And you, building sandcastles by the waves, feeling the breeze in your hair, bending down to smell a flower and smiling at a butterfly. You help make the world too. An antelope running across an empty plain beneath an empty sky, racing with the wind and writing his signature upon the earth helps make the world. An ancient baobab tree, still as stone for a thousand years, has seen oceans of antelope wash over the plain. The tree is home to insects and birds and bush babies, fruit for bats, baboons, even elephants. The baobab helps make the world. Parrots and lovebirds, weavers and hornbills, glow in the green shadows of the baobab. You said parrots. Parrots indeed. <laughs> they build their nests and raise their young, and their singing becomes the music of a silent tree. They help to make the world. And you, Sitting in the shade of an old tree, listening to singing birds, humming your own secret song, and letting your thoughts fly with an antelope, you help make the world too. A single cloud sailing through the sky like a lost daydream throws a shadow over a rice field and river Village and garden, it helps to make the world. Small ponds hold a mirror to the garden. It reflects clouds and stones and branches. 
makes a gathering place for raindrops. As the first drops fall, reflections dance in the ripples. A pond helps make the world. Koi in the pond rise to the dimpling rain, searching for something, a lotus petal, a seed, an insect. They flash and swirl, filling dark waters with color, and they help make the world. And you, surprised by a shower, laughing at the rain, finding your own reflection rippling in the waters and throwing a flower petal to a fish, you help make the world too. And that, is one of the best secrets anyone can know. Thank you all for your help telling this story. And thank you all of you out in the crowd helping to tell this story too. We'll sing our elementary students out of service into their classroom now with the words for the children's benediction printed in your order of service. I'd like to invite Walter Pearson now for a spotlight. <laughs> My walk on song. My name is Walter Pearson, he, him, a member of the Board of Trustees. I stand before you today with great news that reflects our shared commitment to grow, serve, and love. At the June annual meeting, you asked that the board make changes to the adopted budget. I am delighted to say that we have come to an agreement on variances from the budget to align our spending with our core values. We were assisted in this effort by Sally Buckholt, Marilyn Lance, Ann Mowry, and Adrian Stamper. First, we have reinstated our social justice spending. <laughs> including fully funding Amos, DMARC, and the Interfaith Alliance. Ensuring that our, thank you. <laughs> ensuring that our social justice programs continue to make a positive impact. Second, number two. The music budget, which is integral to our worship experience, was been, has been completely restored. The music portion of our service will continue to uplift our spirits. Third, to maintain the cleanliness of our beloved space, a cleaning contract has been authorized. This ensures that our church remains a welcoming and comfortable environment for all who enter. Fourth, third, uh, the equally exciting is the fiscal news. Our planned deficit of $20,000 has been reduced to 5,000 and probably less. <laughs> this action reflects our responsible stewardship of our resources and a commitment to financial health. Okay, finally, I'm pleased to announce that we've received about $20,000 in new pledges. This $20,000 in new pledges demonstrates the generosity of our congregation, but also provides essential work to the vital, essential support to the vital work and ministries of our church. This news is testament to the bounteousness of our community. Together, we are not only sustaining our work, but thriving. Let us continue to grow, serve, and love as we demonstrate financial responsibility and build a stronger, more vibrant future for our beloved church. Thank you for your commitment to the church.
And our quintet will be singing for you today, Lo, How a Rose Are Blooming, as arranged by Phil Matson. Today we take a moment to recognize, honor, and celebrate Unitarian Universalist community ministers. I am what is called a parish minister, which is admittedly an odd term since Unitarian Universalism doesn't organize itself into divisions called parishes. Still, that's the term for people like me. Parish ministers are called by and serve a congregation. But there are also what we call community ministers ministers who aren't parish ministers. The traditions of Unitarian Universalist ministry have included centuries of prophetic ministerial service beyond the walls of congregations. And in 1991, community ministry was formally recognized as a specialization within Unitarian Universalist ministerial fellowship. Community ministers serve the cause of Unitarian Universalism in many ways, as chaplains in hospitals or prisons or the military, as counselors with a spiritual or pastoral orientation, as leaders of community service nonprofit organizations, as spiritual directors or teachers or other forms of ministry outside a congregational setting. 
Community ministers go through the same training as parish ministers. They get divinity degrees, they do internships, they've got to pass an intense examination by our Committee on Ministerial Fellowship. Informed by Unitarian Universalist tradition and theology, UU community ministers serve peace, justice, compassionate relations, and spiritual growth and depth in ways that utilize their ministerial training. Unitarian Universalism informs, grounds, and constitutes the primary religious identification for these spiritual leaders who are providing healing and transformative service in our world. The Reverend Laura Kim Joyner, who happens to be my spouse, is a community minister. Laura Kim, please describe your community ministry. Uh, my pronouns are she and her, and good morning. It, it's such an honor to be able to be a part of this congregation's ministry, and I'm excited about the idea of how the work that I do in the world can support yours as well. And, and how I would describe my work is often as transformational conservation. And what does that mean? It, it means that to be able to cherish and protect all of us, all beings, all wildlife, our nature in this bionic community in which we live, everything has to change. Part of this change is being able to connect more deeply and stronger with our relationships with other beings, other people, with nature. And this is an inner work. This is the inner change. And then the outer change means we need a complete overhaul of our socioeconomic system. I do this ministry in the context of parrot conservation and nature connection activities, which means I'm combining spiritual work with justice making practices in communities all over the world. And so as a wildlife veterinarian and as a conservationist and a minister, this means I'm traveling a great deal. I'm not here all that often. But also for many, many years, I've been working with, doing this work with congregations, with parks, with veterinary schools, just with so many different entities. And now it's time to do it in Iowa. Thank you. Now, Unitarian Universalism is fundamentally a congregation-based movement. To be a Unitarian Universalist is not to have some particular set of beliefs. For us, one's religion isn't about one's beliefs. To be a Unitarian Universalist is to be a part of a Unitarian Universalist congregation. Accordingly, in order for a community minister to maintain good standing as a Unitarian Universalist community minister, he needs to have a formal affiliation with a particular Unitarian Universalist congregation. And to speak to that, our board president, Kevin Beckel. Pursuant to approval by the board of this congregation, First Unitarian uh, of Des Moines is now a congregation, uh, is now the congregation base for a new, to us, Unitarian Universalist community minister. Reverend Laura Kim Joyner is a veterinarian and conservationist doing multi-species ministry as she leads teams in Central and South America to preserve their parrots. She is also accredited as a nonviolent communication facilitator and leads workshops about that. First Unitarian Church of Des Moines celebrates her ministry as a vital part of the liberal religious movement to which our congregation is dedicated. Today, we celebrate by having our public recognition of the special relationship of affiliation between Reverend Laura Kim Joyner and our congregation. Please see the yellow insert in your order of service. Reverend Laura Kim, do you affirm before us to serve the greater community through your actions as community ministers in association with this congregation? I do. Our congregation's mission is to grow ethically and spiritually, serve justly, and love radically. Will you consciously and consistently serve this mission through your community ministry? I will. We thank you, Reverend Joyner, for your multi-species and compassionate com communication ministry. There's one more page. 
Ah, here we go. Nope, oh, that's page one. I've got this one. Okay. There you go, just go ahead. So I will ask you, um, as members of this congregation, to rise and affirm with me uh, the following. We, the First Unitarian Church of Des Moines, recognize you, Reverend Laura Kim Joyner, as a community minister in affiliation with us. We offer our support and encouragement in our ministry in the world. We recognize that your ministry becomes, through affiliation with us, a part of our ministry and that we bear a responsibility to help anchor you within a community of hope, justice, compassion, and Unitarian Universalist communities. We extend to you the right hand of fellowship and urge all of the congregation to do so after the service. Um, you may be seated. Thank you very much. Also, there will be a forum on December 17th that will specifically explore in more detail Laura Kim's uh, community ministry with our congregation, what she does and what she might be able to do with us together. Um, and now we have joys and sorrows. Laura. We are a community of memory and hope, a community of hands and hearts. We gather to share our laughter and our tears and to bear witness to one another as we journey through sorrows and joys. Anne Mowry turned over the reins as chair of pastoral care team to me, Laura Berardi, on December 1st. Anne wrote, it's been a joy to serve in this role with the congregation, team, and the last four ministers. Laura comes to the role having completed a two-year course in pastoral care at the Des Moines Pastoral Counseling Center. And on behalf of the pastoral care team, I can't even look at you, I want to express our deep, heartfelt appreciation for your leadership these last several years. And Anne couldn't give us up completely. She's staying on the team, so that's really wonderful too. Um, second, on Tuesday, Anne Mowry will return home after undergoing surgery on Monday at the University Hospitals to place a deep brain stimulator to relieve the essential tremor she has in her hands. A less invasive procedure will be done a week later. She is optimistic the procedures will be successful and looks forward to returning to many of life's activities that rely on dexterity. Cards or calls are welcome. Please keep Jan Speck and Barb Kluvel in mind as he continues to be treated in Iowa City for bone cancer. Cards are welcome, but no calls or texts at this time, please. Alma Hatfield got through her knee surgery last week and is recovering at home. She loves calls, um, but due to her vision, no cards. And finally, Jim Bush reports that his cancer has returned. Cards are always welcome and he appreciates this community's support as he navigates complicated health challenges. If you need contact information, please see a member of the pastoral care team at the desk outside the auditorium doors. I'll be there after the service with cards for the whole congregation to sign. You can also email pastoralcareteam at ucdsm.org and we'll get you connected. Let us share now the names of anyone we know who could use some special care and attention. You may call the name out loud, or if you're joining us on Zoom, type it into the chat. As we share these names, may the love of this community hold them all. May the light of our community shine on the broken places of the world. May we never look away when we are needed. May the grieving be comforted, the weary find rest, the broken places be healed, and joy and laughter be abundant. We light three candles. One for the joys and sorrows shared aloud, one for those shared in writing, 
and one for those held silently among us. Dear source of healing and wholeness, we call by many names. We are holding in our hearts this morning, members of our congregation, Anne and Alma and Jan and Jim. Let us note the passing of the Reverend Arthur Simon, who died on Tuesday, November 14th. He was a humanitarian, a political organizer and founder of Bread for the World. Since its beginning in 1974, Bread for the World has kept alive and kept healthy and nourished a countless number of people who otherwise would have faced life-threatening and health-threatening hunger and malnutrition. We hold in our hearts also those in need of water. World Bank announced that as of 2022, 2.2 billion people lack safely managed drinking water 3.5 billion lack access to safely managed sanitation. Our gratitude for the good work of UN relief workers bringing safe water into war-torn areas. Yet global investment needs in the water sector exceed 1.37 trillion. We yearn for peace and our world seems to be descending toward violence. The past two years have seen more conflicts than at any time since the end of World War II. The list encompasses not just the wars in Gaza and Ukraine, reports Atlantic Monthly, but hostilities between Armenia and Azerbaijan in Nagorno-Karabakh, Serbian military measures against Kosovo, fighting in Eastern Congo, complete turmoil in Sudan since April, and a fragile ceasefire in Tigray that Ethiopia seems poised to break at any time. Syria and Yemen, have not exactly been quiet during this period and gangs and cartels continuously menace governments, including those in Haiti and Mexico. All of this comes on top of the prospect of a major war breaking out in East Asia, such as by China invading the island of Taiwan. The article is titled, Not a World War, but a World at War. Let there be peace on earth and let it begin with me. Let it begin with us. May we find the wisdom and the courage to contribute to global peace building. And let that begin with cultivating greater peace in our own hearts and greater love. Remembering always and living by those words of Dr. Martin Luther King, that darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that only love. For this and for all that is on our hearts today, we observe a minute of silence. One thousand and two, comfort me. Comfort me, comfort me, comfort me, oh my soul. Comfort me, comfort me, comfort me, oh my soul. Sing with me, oh my soul. 
This morning, I want to speak to you from the depths of my soul. For me, there is a difference between a promise and a vow. A promise is of shorter duration. It reveals who you are. It is the groundwork of trust, the foundation of friendship, and the building of community. A vow is personal and sacred. It is fundamentally life-changing. It is transformative. It is the seed planted in the ground of revelation. Revelation is eradication of ignorance. When a seed is watered, it sends down its radical of truth, drawing deep nutrients from the humus of your life, anchoring its roots into the fiber of your being. Stems and leaves shoot upward to soak up the energy of the sun. It flows in your life's blood. It flowers and produces fruit. All of my vows, except my marriage vows, have been unspoken and only evidenced by the transformation of my life. Here is an example from a seed planted in the humus of my past. I grew up in Ames, a homogeneous college town, mainly composed of upper middle class, well-educated white people. The only people of color in my high school were also well-educated and seemingly well-liked. It was the 1960s and early 70s, a time before skin cancer was thought about. The secret aspiration of most teenage girls was to be tan. I am ghost white. I do not burn. I do not tan. I reflect. <laughs> My skin was a source of snickering and ridicule for my peers. I saw the students of color as beautiful. Tan from birth. I envied that. I had no concept of the prejudice that was and had been in the bedrock of our nation ever since white settlers began to invade the land. That is, not until I married a sailor and moved to Charleston, South Carolina. I was shocked by the attitude and the words of the white community, but still not completely cognizant of the impact. We were poor, gas was cheap back then, so we would drive around and sightsee. One day, we inadvertently turned a corner and found ourselves in a black ghetto. There were teenage boys playing basketball in the street. As soon as they saw us, it was like a movie whose frames had been frozen. One boy stood, hands raised, ready to shoot a basket. No one moved. But one of the young men's eyes shot flaming daggers of hate into my heart and soul. At that moment, all of the horror of the slave ships, the death, the torture, the fetters, the auction block, the ripping of children from the breasts of their mothers as they were sold, the agony of being owned and forced to work endless hours, treated worse than cattle. All of that in that instant cascaded upon me and I knew my skin reflected all at that moment, I was fundamentally changed. I vowed in my heart that if I ever had children, they would never judge anyone by the color of their skin or their social or economic status. That revelation transformed my whole being. I kept that unspoken vow. When I had children, I made sure we lived in the most racially and economically diverse part of the city so they would get to know, respect, and love diversity. We read books together by Black authors like J. California Cooper's book, 
family. And we talked about the hard subjects of our society from the time they were little. That was a long time ago. My children are in their 40s now. I see the fruit of love in their lives, a true blessing. My oldest did not become the lucrative lawyer we all expected, but because of a revelation of her own, she turned and became a teacher. She teaches in an ethnically and religiously diverse high school, human geography, the movement of people throughout history due to such things as racial and religious persecution, slavery, famine, wars, etc. She has taught LGBTQ history and indigenous history. She facilitates the core group of community of racial equity. Best of all, she loves every one of her students. In essence, she is mother to children of every color and ethnicity. Each year, there are kids who trudge up 52 steps to eat lunch in her classroom because they do not feel like they fit in in the cafeteria. They have self-proclaimed her room as the misfit lunchroom. Every sacred vow I have ever made has transformed me and brought me blessings I never could have anticipated. Love transforms and blesses all. We come now to our offering. Contributions to our Faith in Action partners by members and friends may be made by scanning the QR code on the back of your order of service. Free Store helps provide household items to families recovering from domestic violence and other trauma. The Iowa Trans Mutual Aid Fund financially supports trans, non-binary, and gender diverse Iowans as they access gender affirming care. The living tradition we share draws on direct experience of transcending mystery and wonder that moves us to a renewal of the spirit and an openness to the forces that create and uphold life. Our religion reflects and informs our ethics and values. Our religion also reflects and reinforces the bonds that hold us together as a community. And something more, together we learn transcending mystery and wonder, how to directly experience it for ourselves, and how to open ourselves to forces of life. Together, we deepen those experiences and integrate them into our lives. So let there be an offering, the gratitude and generosity are both cause and result of our spiritual growth. And it falls now to us to renew our spiritual home.
Transformation is our theme for December. Change, of course, is inevitable. We can't help but change, whether we want to or not. And the first task is to accept this. Don't try to fight change, and when it comes, as it is continually coming, let go of that impulse to pine for good old days. Embrace change. That's the first point. But transformation suggests something a little more than the random or seemingly random vicissitudes of change. Transformation, in the sense of a spiritual orientation, suggests a certain intentionality about it. There's changing by accident, and then there's changing on purpose. And transformation should have some purpose driving it, but not too much. Some intentionality, but not too much intentionality. Remember that your purpose comes out of who you are now. And as you remake yourself, leave room for new purposes to emerge. Don't try to control the process beyond a very gentle guidance. It's like being a parent, only being a parent for yourself. A good parent knows, as Khalil Gibran said, your children are not your children. They are the sons and daughters of life's longing for itself. They come through you, but are not from you. And though they are with you, they yet belong not to you. You may give them your love, but not your thoughts, for they have their own thoughts. You may house their bodies, but not their souls, for their souls dwell in the house of tomorrow, which you cannot visit, not even in your dreams. You may strive to be like them, but seek not to make them like you, for life goes not backward nor tarries with yesterday. You are the bows from which your children as living arrows are sent forth, end quote. So I'm suggesting take the same approach to yourself, for you too are a child of life's longing for itself, and what you transform into comes through you but not from you. Parenting a child or parenting yourself, either way, you offer gentle guidance, not control. You protect safety, make a safe space in which your child or yourself can become what life means for them or you to be. This idea of control is worth looking into in some detail, especially if we're going to teach ourselves to let go of it a little. The Stoic philosophers emphasize not worrying about what isn't in your control, and that is such an important wisdom. Let go of concern for what isn't in your control. But what is in your control? There is a further wisdom that recognizes that any control is ultimately an illusion. Your thoughts? Well, no, your thoughts are not in your control. Try sitting very still and very quiet, lowering your eyelids so that they are almost but not quite shut, gazing downward at a 45 degree angle and bringing all your awareness to something in the present, noticing perhaps the minute details of the sensations of breathing in and breathing out. You will notice soon, before long, a thought will intrude. The mind will wander off from the assignment you have given it. I need to do my laundry soon. So-and-so was curt with me. What was that about? Perhaps I'll start a garden. What's playing at the theaters? What's for lunch? You didn't ask for those thoughts. You didn't choose them. They just popped up. And if your thoughts aren't, are, and, if you, and if your thoughts aren't in your control, then can the actions that flow from those thoughts be? They certainly seem to be in our control. And it's important that they seem to be. The illusion is a necessary one, but let's be clear that it's an illusion nonetheless. Spiritual deepening involves gradually seeing through the illusion of control. Sages in many times and places have recognized that we're not in control, and recently scientific methods have confirmed it. Benjamin Lee Bay's experiments in the mid-1980s showed that the motor signal is headed to the muscle several hundred milliseconds before we become conscious of it. We have already begun the action before the apparatus of conscious decision-making comes online. 
For most of day-to-day life, consciousness isn't deciding what to do. Consciousness's job is to come along after the fact, notice what we are doing, and to make up a story about how what we're doing is what we meant to do. (laughs) All day long, it's in there going, I meant to do that. Oh yeah, I meant to do that too. But the meaning to do it trails the beginning of doing it. Our brains create a running commentary on whatever we're doing, even though the interpreter module has no access to the real causes or motives of our behavior. In Michael Gazaniga's experiments, he flashed the word walk in a part of the visual field that would be seen only by the right hemisphere. It's the left hemisphere that processes language consciously, so subjects were not conscious of seeing the word yet many of them would stand and walk away. When asked why they were getting up, subjects had no problem inventing a reason. I'm going to get something to drink, they might say. Our inner interpreter module is good at making up explanations, but not at knowing that it has done so. My language centers and neocortex notice my behavior They make up a story about this character named Meredith, who is heroic, yet with certain endearing foibles. (laughs) At each moment of the day, this Meredith can be found deliberately and intentionally acting. Whatever it is Z is doing is a reasonable part of Z's pursuit of reasonable purposes. This is an after-the-fact story. The behavior came first, we now know. And people of great spiritual awareness have recognized long before Libé or Gazaniga came along that this story was, this story of the self was a fabrication. With spiritual development and seeing through the illusion of control comes an increased appreciation of grace, the wonder, the beauty, and the abundance that cannot be earned or deserved. Decreased worry and anxiety from trying to control outcomes. Decreased attachment to the ego's story about either accomplishments or failures. A decreased interest in blaming self or others. Why would our brains be built to generate this illusion of control? One plausible suggestion offered by Janet Kwasniak is that the conscious feeling of intent is simply a marker indicating that we own the action. This marker is very important so that our episodic memory shows whether actions were ours or just happened. The memory of an event that came from me influences my neurons for the future. We do learn from our actions and their results. If I get a pain from something I did, my neural wiring makes me less likely to do that again. But if the pain just happened, if it was apparently not a result of some particular behavior of mine, that affects my wiring uh, in a different way. What we call volition is not a generator of behavior, but only a perception that a behavior is ours. The illusion that intentions precede and determine action is a byproduct of the way the brain learns from experience. We are not in control. And yet, and yet, and yet, and yet, intentions do matter. It matters that we set an intention for what we're going to do today, for this week, or with this one precious life. There's a distinction to be made between the the after-the-fact rationalizations that our impulses of the moment come up with versus the large overarching story of the purpose of our lives. Both, it would seem, are fabricated stories, but the overarching story has the power to feed back down into those subconscious places that generate particular behaviors. In other words, conscious brain has no idea what's going on in the subconscious. So conscious brain just makes up a story. Yet, subconscious brain is listening to that story, and it starts taking it into account. It listens with a skeptical ear at first, but if the story is referenced repeatedly, the subconscious wiring adjusts. Say one time you did a favor for someone. 
Maybe you did it for purely self-interested reasons, but you happen to have been asked why you did it, and you fabricated a story, not from any intent to deceive, but because it's the job of your conscious brain to invent rationalizations, and say that your story was that you care about the well-being of others. Subconscious brain was listening to that story. It was not entirely sure whether to believe what it heard, but it made a little note. It sort of went, huh. And if, that, if it so happens that you have other occasions to tell that story about yourself, then the story gets reinforced a little more. What began, as all our explanations of our behavior do, as an after-the-fact rationalization, can eventually become an actual driving force. And that leads us to the question for today. What is your great vow? I'll talk about how to discover the vow that is within you after our interlude. What is the promise your life makes to life itself? It's just a story, sure, but it's a story that can be potent. I had a six month sabbatical back at the end of 2019 and beginning of 2020, the six months immediately prior to the beginning of the pandemic, as it turned out. And I spent that sabbatical in residence at a monastery in Klatskanai, Oregon. It was called Great Vow Zen Monastery. When we weren't meditating or doing the work to maintain the place, there were occasional group classes and workshops. As its name implies, Great Vow Zen Monastery facilitates reflection about the vow in your life, in our lives, the overarching story of our commitment and values that comes to be our guiding force. We can have a vow of the moment, like vowing to get dinner on the table, but the underlying vow is what you get if you keep asking why. To adapt an example from the book, The Vow Powered Life by Jan Chosen Bays, who is the abbot of Great Vows and Monastery, suppose a youth vows to become the highest scoring player on her basketball team. 
If she happens to be asked, or to ask herself, a series of why questions, there are various directions that she might go. She might want to impress a certain prospective mate that she has her eye on. Why? There are, again, various possible answers. Perhaps because I eventually want to have a long, happy marriage like my grandparents had. Why? Because I want a, a deep and lasting connection to another human being. Why? To learn to love other people genuinely and also myself. And this is where the question stops. We recognize implicitly that we have reached an ultimate. The series of why questions might have taken us down a very different path to a different ultimate. She might instead have said she wanted to become her team's top scorer in order to get a scholarship to college, and that would, that would otherwise be unaffordable. Why does she want to go to college? She might say to get a good job, or she might say to learn about international politics, and those would each lead to a different ultimate. Whatever it might be, when you get to that ultimate that puts a stop to further why questions, that's your great vow. When our young basketball player first formed her determination to be her team's top scorer, there were almost certainly a variety of urges at work. As my father once said to me, son, nobody ever did anything for only one reason. If subjected to the pleasure of, uh, to the, if subjected to the pressure of why questions, she will, she will select rationales that sound good at the time. Yet the subconscious is listening to what the conscious brain makes up, and if the story is one she sticks to, it will gradually become a true guide. The great vow is your personal mission. Most of us are used to mission statements for institutions, companies, congregations, but do you have a mission statement for your life? If you do, you've articulated your great vow. If we are never pressed for an ultimate purpose, then we might spend our lives pulled this way and that by forces of the moment. So it's important to pursue that series of why questions, get down to an ultimate that feels right and stick to it and keep repeating it, especially as an explanation for what you're doing to strengthen the link between your words and your actions. And each time you sincerely say it, you reinforce your orientation toward realizing that world that you dream of. As you think about how you would articulate your great vow, it'll be helpful to reflect on sources of vow. There are three sources to particularly attend to. Inherited, reactive, and inspired. Try to remember those three because I'm going to come because I'm going to ask you about those later inherited reactive and inspired first, what is your inherited vow. As you were growing up, what were you given to understand by your parents or your primary caretakers was the primary function of a life. They may never have articulated it to you, but if you had to now articulate what your parents great vows were what were they. My parents were both professors, as I've mentioned. Mom's field was chemistry and physics. Dad's was English. In the early years of my life, they were grad students, and then they settled into professorships. So my inherited vow from both of them was, one, learn stuff, two, teach it to others. These vows made sense to me, and they guided me through young adulthood as I became a professor myself. You might, however, have reached age 18 that uh, feeling that your parents showed you more about how you wanted not to be than how to be. So that leads to the second possibly important source for your vow, reactive vows. As Jan Chosen Bays explains, reactive vows can ricochet through generations. For example, a child raised by a military father who is precise, strict, authoritarian, and conservative may become a hippie. The hippie's child, tired of dirty clothes and living out of a van and not having predictable meals, may decide to become an accountant who lives in the same house for 40 years and hoards food, toilet paper, and paper clips. The accountant's child may become a rock musician perpetually on tour, the musician's child a buttoned-up stockbroker, and so on. Our reactive vows can be a response to a situation faced while growing up. Um, uh, often react that's a different way that reactive vows can be formed 
People who become physicians often have had an experience with an illness or death in their early years, either in themselves or in their family. And their choice of profession may be due to an unconscious desire to gain control over the helplessness and vulnerability they felt as they faced a sickness and death at an age when they had no defenses for, or coping skills. Incidentally, many lawyers seem to be impelled into law after an early experience of injustice. A reactive source of vows is not a bad thing. It could be overreactive, but it might be just right reactive. What makes it reactive is that it's driven by a desire to avoid something, avoid being like your parents, or avoid a kind of experience such as sickness or injustice. So, in spite of the inherited vow, the reactive vow, and third is inspired vows. We've got inherited, reactive, and inspired. We pick up our inspired vows, often in adolescence or early adulthood, when we learn about someone we admire. We aspire to be like them. Martin Luther King Jr.'s vow of nonviolence came from an inspired vow, inspired by the life and work of Mahatma Gandhi. Athletes often draw inspiration from a particular athlete that they admire. So who are your heroes? These, these three sources of vow are for you to reflect on, the inherited, reactive, and inspired. Ultimately, though, you cannot discover your vows by thinking. Your vow lies within you. To bring it out, to consciously articulate and thereby strengthen it as the orientation of your life, it helps to explore those three questions. What did you learn from parents or primary caretakers about what life is for? What are your inherited vows? Second, what negative lessons have you learned? Lessons about what you wanted to avoid, if at all possible. What are your reactive vows? And third, who are your heroes? What are your inspired vows? So here is what I am asking you to do. And do this today, when you get home this afternoon, before you forget. Write down your answers about inherited vow, reactive vow, and inspired vow. Then sleep on it. Sometime tomorrow, look again at what you wrote, what you put down about your three sources, inherited, reactive, inspired, and then in that light, draft your great vow that modifies and brings those three together. You can share it with others. I would love to hear what you discern or you can keep it to yourself, but let it transform into who you are. Let it transform you into who you are. Amen. Our closing hymn, for our closing hymn, please rise as you are willing and able to sing 168, One More Step.
Please say with me our, our unison chalice extinguishing words. They're found in your order of service. May this flame, symbol of transformation. Nope, that's the lighting. Oh, I'm sorry. The extinguishing. Oh, oh dear. Okay. As we extinguish this flame, may we remember always the flame of life and connection within us and among us and our calling to serve, to grow, and to love as we continue the journey of transformation. The ongoing and ever-present task is to transform into who we are. May it be so. Go in peace. i